Good morning, TCC. My name's Jake, and this is Steve. And hey, we're just so excited that you joined us this morning. And thank you for taking advantage of our new style of church. Yeah, thanks for being flexible. We're working with leadership, trying to do our best to follow the Lord's lead and stay connected as a community, as a church fellowship, and, and seek the Lord. So again, thank you for being with us this morning. We're gonna go right into a time of worship now. So if you've gathered with a small group, if you wanna stand, uh, do so, and uh, let's worship together.
Hey church, welcome to TCC Online. I'm so glad that you've tuned in today to worship the Lord, to dig into His Word, and to allow some time to wrestle with the Holy Spirit through discussion and self-reflection. Today's teaching is going to feel a bit different. It's going to be a lot more like a Bible study than it would a message. So make sure you have your Bible handy with you. You're going to need it. It will also be a little bit shorter, and it's going to include some time to reflect on a few questions that are going to pop up on the screen. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can handle these questions, all right? So if you're watching today with your family and your friends, you're sitting in your living room on your couch, uh, in a group of 10 or less, of course, uh, then you can press pause when you see the questions and take some time to answer them in the best way that you can. If you're watching this alone today, or if you're just more of an introvert and like you don't want to have to talk to your spouse or kids, totally get that with the lockdown procedures, then just take a moment to do some personal reflections and write down your answers on some paper. Hey, I'm excited about what God's doing through the church in this season, and I pray that you would join in with him where you see him on the move already. Now, we're still in our series, Marked, and I hope that you've been reading along with us through the reading plan. It's super important that you're doing that in the next coming weeks. Uh, we heard a pastor say recently that with all that's going on in the media, all kinds of stuff that's swirling, if we think that we can spend more time scrolling through our news feeds and less time in the Word, and then somehow not feel anxious and scared, then we're only kidding ourselves. At a time like this, we need to make sure that we're spending more time in the Word than anything else. Only then will the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. Today we're going to focus on Mark chapter 10, specifically the stories of the, the children coming to Christ, the rich young ruler, and the blind beggar. And I want us to look at how these stories all relate with each other. So let's start with Mark chapter 10, verse 13 through 16. It says, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. But the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and he blessed them. Now this is a beautiful story and a story that reflects the character of Christ in such a great way. These were little kids, some of them babies even, who were being brought to Jesus by their parents for a blessing. And some of the words used here point towards something like a dedication. The same words are also used when referring to a sacrifice in other places in the Bible. So it's painting this picture of parents bringing their kids to Christ, saying, we are giving our kids to you. We're going to allow you to raise them up. We're going to raise them up in your ways, and we are seeking your blessing. But the disciples, they tried to step in and stop the parents from coming to Jesus. And you have to remember when reading through Mark that out of all of the Gospels, Mark presents the disciples in the worst possible way. They're dense, they don't understand things, and to Mark, the disciples aren't even role models for the Christian faith. And the reality is that we just don't know why the disciples did this. Maybe the disciples knew Jesus had a busy schedule to keep. Maybe there was some kind of health scare at the time and they were trying to practice social distancing. Get it? We just don't know why they did this though in reality. But Jesus, he rebukes his disciples and he teaches them a valuable lesson. Jesus says in verse 14, let the children come to me. Don't stop them for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Now this is huge. Let's look at what this means together this morning. Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God to a, to a mostly Jewish crowd. And so what is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom is the rule of God in the heart and life, together with all of the blessings that result from this rule. In the Jewish community, following the laws of Moses was huge, and in Judaism, a kid wasn't considered to be under the law until their 13th birthday. Only then were they old enough to relate to God through the law. So by Jesus saying to his followers that Jesus, uh, Jewish kids could receive the kingdom was basically saying the law that you're set on following, it's not the way to enter God's kingdom. Instead, Jesus is demonstrating to us that we receive his kingdom by relying fully on the love and grace of the God who has made huge promises to his people. Age has no nothing to do with it. And this is where the childlike faith principle kicks in. Think about kids for a moment. Young kids don't have any problem accepting a gift from someone when they didn't do anything to earn it. It's not until a kid matures that things like pride and critical thinking get in the way of accepting generous gifts. As adults, we look at something pretty critically when something of value is being given away for free, like, all right, what's the catch here? But kids, see, kids know that there's nothing that they could do to earn or deserve the Lord's blessing, and they receive it completely with joy and trust. And that's what it means to receive the kingdom with childlike faith. We put our full hope and faith in the hands of our God who loves us and we trust in his promises.
This idea continues as we look at the rich young ruler in verses 17 through 25. As Jesus and his disciples are leaving, a young man rushes up to Jesus, bows down and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now there's two things that you need to underline or highlight right there. The young man calls Jesus good teacher and he says, what must I do? Now those are important. Let's start with good teacher. Jesus was a good teacher, a rabbi, and a good one at that, the best. But no other rabbi had ever been called good teacher. Being called good meant being sinless and perfect. And in Judaism, only God was called good by Jewish teachers. So Jesus notices this, and not in a disagreeing sort of way, but as a way to force the young man to truly think about what it was that he was saying. He asks him, why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? And Jesus wants him to think about this. Are you calling me good because you want me to respond to your request a certain way? Are you throwing around the word good haphazardly without really giving it a lot of thought about what it would mean for you personally to call me good teacher? Why do you call me good? And it's important because how he answers that question, it should cause him to evaluate what he asked Jesus to do in the first place, which is the second thing that we should underline. What must I do? This young man had money, he was successful, he knew how to get what he wanted, and from the beginning here, he's looking at eternal life, receiving the kingdom of God as something that a person could get from their own works, their own effort, from their own treasure. You see, to him, eternal life, receiving the kingdom, was something tangible that he could add to his stockpile. It was something else that he could own. He didn't realize that in the moment, in that moment right there, just by bowing down at Jesus' feet, he was closer to salvation than anything else that he could do or get on his own. The rich young ruler believed that the end was near and that he needed to be saved, but he didn't think that he needed a savior. He wanted Jesus to tell him what he needed to do so he could save himself. He was relying on his own abilities, his own strengths, his own knowledge, and he thought he could figure out a better formula on his own. Again, not realizing that he was standing face to face with the savior of the world, the only way. See, it made me wonder, how many of us are in that same situation right now with what's going on in our world today? How many of us are trying to do everything we can to save ourselves, not realizing that we serve a God who cares about us and has all the answers for us already? How many of us are trying our best to find peace through stockpiling goods, trying to find security by caring for ourselves and, and pushing away others? looking for truths from the world rather than looking to the truth of God's word as we try to make sense of everything. Notice the posture of the rich young ruler. He was acting as though he, is, he was ready to do whatever it takes to receive the kingdom of God. And so Jesus asked the young man if he had followed the laws. And the laws that Jesus lists are from the Ten Commandments, more specifically from the second tablet of commandments. The first tablet of commandments had to do with loving and obeying God. And the second, however, had to do with loving others. Jesus probably only asked about the laws from the second tablet because if you don't love your neighbor, you don't love God. Jesus also asked about the second set of commandments because it's talking about stealing, withholding, or defrauding your neighbor. Now the idea of stealing from your neighbor is something we all understand and agree with. But the idea of withholding carries with it the idea of withholding anything that should be theirs, whether that's reputation, wages, knowledge of the gospel, help in times of need, or you know, toilet paper, right? So are we hoarding things from our neighbors, the physical things and the emotional components? The rich young ruler's response is an honest one, but a shallow one. He said, I've followed those laws since I was a kid. And we have no reason not to believe him. In his interpretation, he, had, he hadn't acted on any of those laws outwardly. But Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount that it's not just about our actions, it's about our heart. We can have a heart filled with adultery even if we never commit it. A heart that's filled with murder even if we never follow through. A heart that steals even if we've never stolen so much as a piece of gum. See, God cares about our hearts as much, or if not more, than our physical actions. So what's been in your heart this week? As you read the news, as you look at your neighbors, as you watch viral videos from grocery stores, if your heart could speak, what would it be saying? Would it be God-honoring? If the, the rich young ruler would have thought about this law in this way, there's no doubt that he would have acknowledged the need for a Savior, that he, by himself, was unable to fulfill the law. But he didn't. And yet... Jesus still looks at him with a look of genuine love, realizing that this was truly a good person, that this kid had done his best to follow the law, but it wasn't enough. And rather than scold him or correct him, Jesus plays along with the young man and says, so you wanna earn your way to eternal life? How about this? Do it all, sell everything and give away all your money to the poor and follow me. Now this isn't Jesus telling you that it's okay or it's not okay to have money or to give all of your profits to the poor. It's also not Jesus agreeing that you can earn your way into heaven by giving everything you own away. But the rich young ruler immediately realized the weight of the Lord's request and what his God was in his life, realizing that he could never take his money out of the top spot in his life, and he sadly walked away. 
This was Jesus' way of saying two things. You can't earn your way to heaven and trust in me. We know this because the disciples who witnessed this, they asked Jesus what he meant. And again, Mark paints the disciples as a bunch of airheads. But the disciples believe what most Jews believed at the time. And that was that being rich was a sign of God's approval. So if the wealthy can't be saved, then who can be saved? And Jesus says, exactly. Humanly speaking, no one can be saved. But through God, through God, everything is possible. No matter how kind and considerate a person may be, human goodness can never earn entrance into God's kingdom. We can contrast the dependence of a child with the independence of a rich man. Jesus indicated that it was much more likely that the child would inherit the kingdom of God than the rich man. See, a child is dependent on the parent to protect them, to care for them, to keep them alive even. The rich man lives an independent life. He lives off of his ability to make things happen for himself. The rich man doesn't depend on others. He's got it all under control. Also, in order to get to that point of being rich, it oftentimes means that you have to be a successful doer. And he had done well, therefore he was rich. And if you follow that line of thinking through, it would be very easy for a wealthy person to think that salvation and a relationship with the Lord is also a matter of just successfully doing. But in reality, it's about humbly receiving like a child. It's really easy to be scared into this thinking that as a Christian, I don't want to look to God as some magical genie who I use to grant my wishes. I, I'm not going to ask him for things. I'm not looking for his generosity. Like, I don't want to be considered a fan of prosperity gospel, prosperity preaching, which is a good thing to avoid. But we have to balance this notion with the reality that there's nothing that we can do to earn the greatest prosperity of all, the kingdom of God. We can't earn that on our own, through our own good works, through our own treasures, through our own anything. It's only through Christ Jesus and what he does for us. which leads me to our last story of the day. Then Jesus comes to Jericho and he's leaving town and this blind beggar named Bartimaeus hears the commotion and he catches wind that Jesus of Nazareth is in the area. Bartimaeus must have heard the stories of the miracles that Jesus had performed and he believed in them because he begins to shout out as loud as he can, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people nearby responded by telling Bartimaeus to shut up, be quiet. And it's crazy that people were so upset with the beggar's voice on this day because we know that at this point in history, a beggar would prop himself up in the same spot at the same time every day. So you know people have heard this guy begging for change, asking for people to help him. But now all of a sudden, him speaking up is a big deal. Maybe it's because yelling at the Messiah wasn't deemed appropriate to those who were followers of Christ. There was no reverence in that type of behavior. Maybe it's because some people weren't ready to believe that Jesus was actually the son of David. Maybe it was because they were afraid of what the religious leaders would say and do if this got out of hand in the city. Or maybe, maybe it's because the enemy has no problem with us begging for stuff as long as we're not begging for God. The enemy will oftentimes encourage you to keep begging as long as it's for stuff in order to keep you in a cycle of brokenness and need. But when people told him to be quiet, he shouted out, more, he shouted out louder. He knew the only one who could help him out of the situation that he found himself in was the healer the son of David, Jesus the Messiah. And Jesus heard him and told his disciples, send him over. The disciples said, take courage, he's calling you. Now don't overlook this. I would highlight, underline, or write these words down for, the, for this time that we find ourselves in today. Take courage, he's calling you. Jesus said this often, take courage. It was a command, it was non-optional. It was full of cheer and hope. And even now, in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, today and always, Jesus is calling us to his side. He calls us and says, take courage. I'm here to comfort, to cheer, to heal, and to restore. Blind Bartimaeus threw off his baggy coat, not wanting anything to get in his way of reaching Jesus, and he jumps to his feet with urgency, similar to the rich young ruler in that he was eager and ready, but different in the sense that it wasn't about what he could do. It was about what Jesus was going to do for him. Then Jesus says, what do you want? Now, this might have sounded cold to the people who were watching. I mean, come on, Jesus, this is a, this is a blind beggar, right? You, you know what he wants. And Jesus did know in his heart what Bartimaeus wanted. But he wanted the blind beggar to think about it. And he wanted to see if he was bold enough to ask for something many would have said was impossible. And Bartimaeus said, I want to see. I want to see. To which Jesus responds, it's done. Your faith has healed you. And blind Bartimaeus was blind no more. And that took complete faith in Jesus to ask for sight. It took humility to ask for something as great as it was from Jesus. That was bold. It was a, a pure expression of this man's heart. In an act of obedience, Bartimaeus follows Jesus. Today, I want us to realize that we can do nothing to get to heaven, but be willing to receive 
and be willing to ask in total faith for what we need and to trust that we will be heard by a good God who cares about us. Would you bow your heads and pray with me today? Father God, thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to to, to do church, to experience your goodness, to experience your word today, wherever we're sitting, in different houses, and different groups. Lord, thank you so much that, that you still reign, that we can still meet together, that we can still fellowship as a community of believers. God, I pray that we would take this word to heart, that we would be bold when we come to you, that we would experience what it is to have a childlike faith yet again. And God, that as, as we continue to live this out, live out what this looks like, our childlike faith, our, our obedience, our, our boldness, and, and our, our prayer lives, that, that people would begin to look to us, and they would see a sense of calmness, a sense of, of peace, and they would say, what is it that allows you to be peaceful in this moment? And God, that we would be able to, to see that as doors being opened for an opportunity to share the good news of the gospel, to share the good news of, of your son, Jesus. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we can spend some time together this morning. And we pray. Amen. Well, hey, thanks for joining us for our online service. We are so glad that you tuned in. Yeah, and as part of our worship on a weekly basis is we give our tithes and gifts uh, to the Lord. And so um, inviting you to do that. There's a number of ways you can uh, give online. That's available for you here. Or you can mail in uh, your tithes and gifts uh, to our uh, to our office. We're open and we are eager to stay connected and to um, pray for you. And if there are prayer requests, keep those coming in. Our care elders are active right now as our deacons are as well to, to meet needs both within the church and within our community. Um, but now as you go into your week, know that you have a God who cares for you, that he's a good father and now go in that peace. Amen.